Hi, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining me as I bring you some breaking news about the mystery childhood pneumonia that is occurring in China. This is a very important topic because, as we know, China tends to have these things occurring there first before it spreads to the rest of the world. So one of the questions is, could this just be a Chinese problem and it's unique to China or similar to what happened in the pandemic? Is this a trend that we're going to see occurring across different parts of the um, of the world? It's important to note that for me, I think that I've been very disappointed in the context of the pandemic in that. It seems that there doesn't seem to be a curiosity among the scientific community. And I'm trying to understand why. What I mean by that is we had earlier in the pandemic, we had an outbreak across the world of childhood hepatitis. And there was no clear answer. Nobody seemed to link it to anything. There was an elephant in the room, but nobody would dare to connect the two. So it was left alone. Then we had monkeypox, and monkeypox spread across the world in a way that had never been seen before. And again, it's just, well, it's just another one of these things. I can't understand that approach to stance. There should be a curiosity. Every stone should be turned in order to find answers. That's just my way of looking at it. It may be different for other people. And so similar to what I'm saying here is that when I see an unusual pattern, I would then try and see if I can make sense of it. So this is just me trying to make sense of what I think is a very important point around this childhood pneumonia, because I think it could be relevant for the rest of the world. I'm going to take you through a few news stories and breaking news from Nature, which came out today. And then I'm going to share with you some ideas about uh, chest X-rays, uh, some ideas about why I think that it's linked to the specific bacteria, mycoplasma, as well as taking you through just some general ideas about mycoplasma. So this is actually quite an important area to cover. So just hang fire with me as I try and break down a bit of the science. Understand that these are just my thoughts. And I am just a simple clinician who is interested in science. So if you want to share in that bit of information with me, just hang around. So let's start with the news story. So this was in The Sun, I think a few days ago, where it was talking about kids with chilling white lung syndrome overwhelming China hospitals as doctors get a thousand calls a day on mystery illness. And so they were talking about this white lung syndrome that seemed to be occurring at overwhelming hospitals across China. So, of course, other parts of the world, including the UK, are monitoring that closely. And it's effectively the WHO got involved and tried to get some more information about what exactly was happening in China and was this relevant to the rest of the world. And one thing I will say, some people may criticize China, but I can say that when the pandemic started in Wuhan, initially there was some resistance with regards to China giving information. But once they started to share data, they shared remarkably valuable data. That was what allowed me to do some of my research around autoimmunity. So I appreciated that. And I hope that they would do the same in this situation as it continues to evolve, if it evolves at all. And so the question is, what really could be behind this abnormal pattern? So this is the bit of information that has come out just today from Nature. So you can see there today, the 27th of November, 2023. So again, they are asking the questions about uh, scientists expected a surge in respiratory disease, but what is happening in China is unusual. And as I said, unusual patterns require us to look a little bit more closely as to what could be going on. 
that's just science. I can't understand why we wouldn't do anything like that. So a little bit more from the article here is China was grappling with the surge in respiratory illness, including pneumonia in children. And so the World Health Organization wanted last week uh, information uh, about common winter infections rather than any new pathogens. And that's important so that people don't start thinking this is a new virus per se. I'll clarify that in a little bit. But the point being, these are similar pathogens to what had been driving infection in children in the past. Specifically, what they were looking at uh, when they we go down here is that the in the November statement, the WHO said China's health authorities had attributed the rise in hospitalizations since October to known pathogens, such as the normal viruses, adenovirus, influenza, SARS-CoV-2, RSV, and which only caused mild cold-like symptoms. However, the admissions to hospitals in children since May, particularly in areas like Beijing, was mainly due to mycoplasma pneumonia. It's a bacteria that infects the lung. And as they say, it's a common cause of walking pneumonia, a form of the disease that's usually relatively mild and doesn't require bed rest or hospitalization. But this is hitting children at this point. And one of the reasons why they were thinking that this was occurring was largely because, uh, one, they were mentioning the concept of immunity debt, meaning that children weren't actually exposed to viruses as normal before. And therefore, now that they're seeing more viruses, there is an issue with regards to them being able to manage it. Additionally, there's an important point that's unique to China, and that is, although this pneumonia can be caused by the bacteria usually treated with antibiotics, known as macrolides, in China, over-reliance on these drugs has led to resistance. And they think that it's between 70 to 90% resistance that can occur with mycoplasma pneumonia. So this is unique to China and would raise the question as to whether or not that would become an issue in other parts of the world. I think Japan has as well significant resistance to this bacteria because of wide use of antibiotics. But wherever you see that, you could then have a situation where you have higher risk of problems in the future with regards to this. So here is now where I want to break down a few ideas about what happens with regards to a chest infection. It took me some time to piece this together, so bear with me. It's not necessarily perfect images, but just to give you an idea as to what it is that we would see clinically. So here is just an image of uh, two chest infect um, two chest x-rays. So here on the right, this is what we would call a normal chest x-ray. And here down the middle here, making this little bump here is a heart. And then on the, the both sides, the dark part are the lungs full of air. And then you have here just in front of it, these are the ribs. And up here are the clavicles. And that's essentially a normal chest x-ray. And down at the bottom here, this line represents the diaphragm on both sides. And just here is the stomach bubble. This is a typical chest x-ray. On this side, I had to find a chest x-ray. This is not a child. This is an adult. And you can see a bigger heart. So this pro person probably has some heart failure. But you can see that there's a lot more patchiness within the lung part, um, which is suggestive that maybe this could be heart failure. This could be an infection. This is probably heart failure with upper lobe diversion. But this is a picture of what happens when the lungs get congested. And you start to see areas of, of white that come in instead of this dark pattern that you would see in a well-penetrated chest x-ray. So that's a normal versus an abnormal chest x-ray. And here is just an image of a patient who has a pneumonia. And in this one here, you can see the heart again in the middle, right here. The lungs are dark. But then this area here, is now lighting up as being quite white. And this is probably a middle lobe pneumonia on the right-hand side. And so this is what you could see with regards to an infection. 
And the bit that I think is relevant in context of the children, and this is a little bit, um, this is demonstrating what we call ear bronchograms, where they're showing you the trachea and the bronchus and the bronchioles spreading into the, into the lungs. But it's this kind of picture that you could get with a mycoplasma, where it's diffusely spread throughout the lungs. And I think that this is what they would probably be pointing to as a white lung syndrome that they're seeing in children. So with that basis, what is the connection with this mycoplasma pneumonia? And so here is again another image just to help you to understand some of these concepts. This is just really talking about the size of them. So here we have a virus. And you can see the size of a virus here is at 0.05 to 0.1 micrometers. And this here can only be seen by an electron microscope. A mycoplasma is a very small intracellular and extracellular bacteria, meaning that it can get inside the cells, similar to how a virus is. But oftentimes it's on the outside um, of the cells in the cilia of the respiratory epithelium. And you can see the size of it here is 0.1 to 0.5. So it's almost 10 times bigger than a virus. But when you compare it to a normal bacteria, which is 1 to 10 um, micrograms, uh, you can, micro, micrometers, you can see that the mycoplasma is 10 times smaller than a bacteria. And compared to a normal cell, which is between 10 to 100 uh, mic micrometers, you can see that the mycoplasma is pretty tiny compared to it. Now, this is not an exact size. So just imagine that this cell here, which would be a normal cell, is about 50 to 100 times bigger than this mycoplasma. And so it's a small bacteria, one of the smallest ones. It doesn't have a cell wall, which is part of the reason why normal antibiotics don't work against it. And it tends to attach to the lining of what we call ciliated cells. That means the cilia on the respiratory epithelium that sweeps mucus around. Now, this is the bit that I think is very important in the context of mycoplasma. And this is why I think we're now coming to what I consider the elephant in the room. Because why is this happening in children at this time? Immunity debt may be part of it, but I don't think that's the whole picture. Let's just look at a very important piece of information about how SARS-CoV-2 works. This is I've taken from a paper, SARS-CoV-2 replication in airway epithelium requiring motile cilia and microvilla reprogramming. Essentially what the virus does, this is 6 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. It binds on top of the mucus here. So this part here is mucus, binds to the cilia which sweep the mucus along, it slides down, gets inside the cell, and within 24 hours, it makes these tiny microvilli grow into tree-like structures. And then that's how by 48 hours, it's able to just spread all the time. Now, you have to remember that the mycoplasma is bigger than these viruses, but similar to what the virus does, it attaches to the cilia. And additionally, I suspect that it can attach to the microvilli as well. So suddenly, if you have more microvilli lining these respiratory epithelium, it then gives mycoplasma increased chance of binding to it. And that's the bit that I think is very, very important. But is that just my idea? Is there any evidence that this occurs? So, of course, you know that I'd start looking to try and see if there is any connection whatsoever between mycoplasma and SARS-CoV-2 infection. And here we go. This is a paper that was published in April 2022, looking at the severity of co-infection of mycoplasma pneumonia in COVID-19 patients. This is an important point. Because what they were going to find in, that, um, in this paper here, and it, I'll take you back to the paper, this is now showing you that of the co-infections that can occur, mycoplasma pneumonia has had the strongest association with SARS-CoV-2. 
So they found that 7% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients had coexisting bacterial infections and 14% in the ICU setting was with mycoplasma being the leading bacterial pathogen. So there is a link to mycoplasma and SARS-CoV-2. So the, the question is, uh, finally, as I come to that final point, how do I tie it all together? Here is the issue. We're starting to understand that it doesn't matter which vaccine you use, it seems to have an impact on mucosal immunity. It doesn't matter if it is a whole virus vaccine, an mRNA vaccine, a adenovirus vaccine, it impacts systemic immunity, that means in the bloodstream and the lymph nodes, but not as effective against mucosal immunity. What that means is that the lining of the airways are therefore predisposed to being infected by, <clears throat> by SARS-CoV-2. If you have that predisposition, there are two things that will happen. One, as I demonstrated with regards to the microvilli, the infections will occur, it will be harder for the immune system to clear it, and there will be more locations for mycoplasma to bind to. Additionally, the primary mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 is to inhibit interferon. So any cell it goes into, it blocks the interferon response, which is normally an important part of that response against viral infections. Why would that be relevant in the context of mycoplasma? Well, mycoplasma is one of those few bacteria that also is responsive and targeted by interferon. And so the combination of widespread SARS-CoV-2 infection, even if it's mild, with bacterial overgrowth and immune suppression from recurrent infections could predispose to significant mycoplasma breakthrough infections. That's my thought on it. Now, I may not be right about this, but one thing is for certain. The evidence is pointing to the fact that mycoplasma is likely to be an issue. And two, we're having circulating recurrent infections in highly vaccinated regions. I think that this is a problem. As I mentioned before, it's a risk. And part of any health and safety approach is to look at risk and try and work out how would it be mitigated. Not sure how we will get to herd immunity in this context, but there needs to be a strategy to address what is a growing global problem with regards to immunity not being as adequate as it ought to be. The mechanisms for that we can argue about, but one thing is for certain, we still have a big challenge ahead of us with regards to solving what is a serious problem, and it requires all of our minds to work together, not just arguing about any specific ideology. I hope this was valuable. Have a great evening. Thank you.